Ahoy hoy, I'm Planet Walk, and something that I've noticed is quite often geocentrism is often brought up in relation to flat Earth. But geocentrism doesn't have to mean that the Earth is flat. All it means is that the Earth is the centre of the universe. You could have an Earth at the centre of the universe that is a sphere. I bring this up because today we are looking at a video from someone who claims not to be a flat Earther, but the video is titled Geocentrism. The truth? Now the video that we're looking at is quite interesting in the fact that it is a video that is 50 minutes long. However, it only has 20 minutes of content? Like the second half of the video is just the first half of the video again, including the 5 minute countdown. Which is kind of funny given that one of the first things I noticed about this channel is it uploads about 12 hours of content a day. I wonder how they're doing that? Welcome. To Mind Shack. This is your host, Bruce McGuire. Today it's Flat Earth Story Time. People have asked me, obviously, whether or not I am a flat earther or advocating flat earth. Obviously not. I just use flat earth debates as uh, a great educational tool for developing logic and reason. Well, if people are thinking that you're a flat earther from that, you're probably not using very good logic and reason. I do agree that flat earth is an interesting jumping off point for certain topics, but one thing that I do try to make known is that I'm not a flat earther and it seems to be pretty easy to do. The only thing that really leaves people confused is my channel name Planner Walk and I wasn't thinking about flat earth when I came up with that one. I didn't even know what flat earth was. Also I suppose people are confused about my gender as well. As well as analyzing human psychology it's actually <laughs> one of the best topics to do all of these things at once so it's very very efficient so i'm always very hesitant to go into the psychology of someone based on how they do in a debate because like firstly a debate is a very particular setting and often debates encourage people to act in ways that they might not otherwise act in order to win the audience over and depending on the type of environment maybe they're encouraged to be aggressive or maybe they're encouraged to be cordial. A lot of it really is just theatre to either persuade people or even just to entertain. There's also the fact that I'm not exactly a psychologist and I've seen what happens when non-psychologists try to go into the psychology of people debating. You have people from both sides trying to declare that the person from the other side is insane. So, I used to be in academia once upon a time, a quackademia, whatever you want to call it. So I'm very curious as to what this person did because just saying, oh yeah, I used to be in academia and it's full of quacks, it doesn't necessarily mean that you should be taken seriously on that statement. And your reasoning for it is also quite important because I see a lot of people try to say that, oh yeah, academia is full of quacks, but their reasons are just really vague, just I don't trust them. Sometimes there is a little bit more specificity like, I don't agree with them on this particular subject so therefore they must be lying or something. But more often than not it's left pretty vague or presented as a given. And uh, yeah, no, obviously the dogmatic scientism was too much for me. So uh, the cult-like mentality of so-called educational institutions which of course are nothing of the sort. Okay, let's be honest here. What probably happened is you wrote a paper and it didn't pass peer review and now you're salty about it. Or something like that. From what I've seen, academia is quite welcoming of criticisms. However, an important thing is you have to know what you're talking about, otherwise your criticisms will be dismissed. A <laughs> very, very astute observation on how indoctrination facilities basically edumacate the genius out of children. Various studies, of course, support these findings that children enter kindergarten or first or second grade with a lot of genius potential. I don't remember the exact percentages, somewhere around 80% are capable of being geniuses. And then by the time they're out of high school, that drops to under 5%. So I had a look for the study and I couldn't find the study, but I could find people talking about it. And it starts out at 98% and then drops to 2% after high school. Now, one thing I find very important is it doesn't actually show that school is responsible for this decrease because also it correlates with age. Now you might ask, well if it's not school that's causing this then what is it? And it could just be as you get older there are factors that make you less creative. As you grow up you get used to doing things in particular ways and 
why would you change how you do it if it's working for you? I think this is quite evident when you look at how different people treat technology. Younger people pick it up almost instantly. However, with older people, they will often be struggling even though they should be able to theoretically understand it better. Quite a common sentiment amongst older people is a phone should just be able to make texts, calls and nothing else. This is because a lot of the newer things added to phones seem unnecessary when you've gone your whole life without them. However, while some people might find it confusing, there are a lot of people that enjoy the benefits of having a search engine, a music player and a calculator all in your pocket. I don't think this is a function of whether you went to school or not, but more how much are you used to how things used to be? And I think this is the best way to illustrate the point of as you get older, your creativity goes down because you're used to how things are. You don't have to innovate new solutions or anything. Obviously other factors as well. I mean, artificial flavoring, sugars, sodas, all just the poisoning from the air, food, water, etc. I mean, that's just speculation. I don't know how many times I've heard people talk about, you know, they're giving us sugars, they're giving us soda, and it's turning the friggin' frogs gay. I will never uh, tout any kind of degrees as uh, evidence of anything I am saying being uh, valid because to me that's the fastest way to see an argument is to bring up oh well what what degrees do you have oh what are they in so of course a PhD doesn't inherently mean that you're correct you can have a PhD and be incorrect this has happened there have been many cases I've heard but if I am going to trust someone in an argument I am going to trust the person who has actually studied it over the person that has just googled it. As a general rule of thumb, if someone has a PhD in something, they probably know more about that topic than the average person. As if there aren't several different PhDs in every single, on every single topic disagreeing with each other. So clearly the PhD itself is not any kind of metric of who is wrong, who is right, or what is valid. Hold on, I thought you were saying that academia has too much dogma and is like a cult, but now you're saying that they, they disagree? This is why I have a hard time taking anybody seriously when they say that academia is evil and full of quacks, because they often contradict themselves like this. Anybody, so anytime somebody has to, is just that desperate and insecure, they have to drop, oh, I got a degree in such and such from this indoctrination facility. And they're that insecure, is that their subconscious just waving the white flag then and there? I mean, if someone who hasn't done any proper research on something is going to tell someone who has a degree in something that they're wrong about the thing they have a degree in, then I think that's a valid point to point out that they've got a degree. Like if someone's came up to me and said, you said that programmers don't program by typing out zeros and ones, but a computer operates on binary, so therefore you would have to program in zeros and ones, so you must be wrong. I would explain to them that I took a degree and I've done plenty of programming even outside of that degree. So I know that you don't have to type in binary in order to be able to do programming. It's not that I would feel like I'm under attack or anything, I'd just be thinking, hey, I know a little bit more about the subject than you do. Just because you went to a particular indoctrination facility, that doesn't mean other people aren't capable of executing scientific experiments. Possibly even more valid than the ones done at indoctrination facilities specifically funded for certain purposes. But the difference between someone doing an experiment at a university and a random person doing an experiment is that there are more checks and balances at a university when your work has to be peer reviewed. Peer review isn't perfect, but it does help weed out the quacks. There's just so many goofs running rampant in, uh, in the chats and the comment sections that just don't understand these very simple concepts. They haven't obviously looked at any of the introduction to logical fallacies videos I put up on various different fallacies, including appeal to authority. So there are a lot of people I find that use logical fallacies incorrectly to try and dismiss their opponent's argument. Appeal to authority I think is actually a pretty big one where people will say, oh well you're just using appeal to authority, that's a fallacy. When sometimes it might be, hey, there are a lot of people that are knowledgeable on the subject and they probably have a better idea about it than you do. Like if on the subject of Flat Earth I say, I'm going to trust the pilots, the meteorologists, the surveyors, the scientists over a random guy that has supposedly done his research. That technically is an appeal to authority. But the point that's being made there isn't that, hey, all these people must be right. It's that 
all these people that know what they're talking about agree that you're wrong. Why is that? I was always interested in physics and I always kind of uh, knew that there were there was there was weirdness going on, so to speak. I mean, the dogma, just the sheer desperation by corrupt establishments to get everyone to believe what they believe, as opposed to utilizing logic and reason in an objective fashion. OK, so I might be wrong, but what it feels like here is that, ironically, mind shock here is being a little bit dogmatic. A lot of times you'll have people say science should be done in a particular way and only a particular way. You see this quite a bit with flat earthers. They'll say something like if you've got an independent variable then the person doing the research must be able to manipulate the independent variable. Or they'll say something like if you're doing an experiment then there must be absolutely no margin of error whatsoever despite the fact that that is literally impossible. If I had to guess and let's be real I have to do a lot of guessing when it comes to Mindshock because he is being just extremely vague. But if I had to guess, I would say that he probably has an issue with the lack of formal logic or something in science. That's actually quite a big pattern when it comes to people that talk about fallacies. They want everything to be based on formal logic, which, in my opinion, is kind of dogmatic. Especially when you consider that we've got really good theories like Einstein's theory of relativity, which science would never be able to prove is what's happening, but it's pretty accurate. Like if we were to try and show Einstein's theory of relativity being true using formal logic, we could say, okay, P, which is Einstein's theory of relativity, therefore Q, something like gravitational lensing. We see Q, but just because we see Q doesn't mean that we can say that P is true. But science will go, okay, well, seeing as P predicts all this, and all this happened, we should probably regard it as true until something better comes along. But that's my guess. I don't know if it's his actual position. He's being quite vague in this video, which, you know, is a problem in and of itself. But, you know, I've been rambling for quite a while now. The goofs don't realize the textbooks are always changing. Just go back 10 years, 20, 30, 40, 50. And there's, there's this collective narcissism. Oh, yeah, they were wrong and inaccurate before. But everything being taught now, everything in the book now somehow has to be reasonably accurate or, or relatively accurate or even completely accurate. Well, the point of the textbooks changing is that new information has come to light. The fact that they do change does mean that it's not dogmatic. I'd rather things be corrected when they're shown to be wrong rather than continuing to peddle misinformation. Isn't that what we all want? It's just, it's a weird collective narcissism that goofs have to pretend that we're living in some kind of magical time where experts or authorities or scientists can't be completely and utterly wrong about many different topics. I mean, there are people that use that kind of reasoning to dismiss things like the globe, saying that, oh yeah, all these scientists must be wrong, even though that everything that our modern world is built upon is built upon the notion that Earth is a globe. If you remove that as a foundation, then we can't have modern technology. The same goes for quantum mechanics. You say that quantum mechanics are wrong, then technology shouldn't work. So that was always kind of in the background. Obviously, the younger I was, I didn't really... Uh... I couldn't really elucidate that in those terms. There was just some, always something fishy about it when teachers couldn't explain. And there was just a desperation just to believe the book. Like the book can't be wrong. Just believe the textbook. I mean, sometimes there are things that teachers don't know. I know that one of my teachers didn't know how to deploy an ASP.NET website. And so trying to get that information was extremely difficult. It doesn't mean that there is no way to be able to do that. It just means that the teacher didn't know. I mean, to be fair, he knew how to deploy it through Azure, but if you wanted to go with a different route, then he didn't know. But also it is quite important to be able to, you know, read things like textbooks to be able to get your information because if you just rely on your teacher, well, your teacher is a human and humans can sometimes get things wrong. And all these ancient cultures or whatever, they they're, they must have been wrong about their cosmologies, about all their belief systems and, and all of this. I mean, they didn't have access to the information that we have today. Had they known what we know today, then they might have believed something different. When you truly know something, if you truly know that it is a scientific position and not a faith-based belief or just blind faith and corrupt establishments, you don't have that level of insecurity. 
sometimes it can be difficult to make a case for something. Like, if we try to talk about something that I know to be true, then I might have trouble making a case for that. It doesn't mean I'm wrong, it's just that the process of putting thoughts into words can sometimes be a bit tricky. Relativity itself, it just always seemed funny on the surface. Because it's... I. I constantly reference a house of cards as an analogy for, for Einstein's relativity, special and general, where you're just building these house of cards and nobody wants to question the bottom layers and they get all insecure and triggered when anybody wants to even look at those bottom layers to see if the theory holds up. What bottom layers are we talking about? Because here's the thing, relativity works whether you like that fact or maybe you're a scientist and are extremely annoyed at that. Like, here's a point that's been used so many times by now. If it weren't for relativity, then GPS just would not work. Does this mean that relativity has been proven? Of course not. You cannot prove something like relativity because science does not prove theories. And if you want to say, hey, I think that relativity is false, then cool. But we're gonna need something else that also works and explains everything that relativity does. At this point, I'm pretty sure scientists are actually going, yeah, we're pretty sure that there are flaws in relativity, but we don't have anything better at this moment. And everybody just has to hallucinate or just do all of this reverse engineering or post hoc fallacies involved in trying to make the pieces fit in order to make relativity true by inventing dark matter, by invoking all of these assumptions and hallucinations and pretending they're true just to justify the faith in this theory. Okay, here's the thing about dark matter. We have actually found some of it. Not all of it, not even the majority of it, but we have found some of it. Basically, some of the dark matter turned out to be cold hydrogen, which we couldn't see because, as it turns out, cold stuff tends not to emit light. But anyway, we don't know what the rest of the dark matter is, so what's going on? Shouldn't we just ditch relativity? No, because relativity is the best thing that we've got at the moment. The only way to get rid of it would be to come up with something better. And seeing as it does work if there is dark matter, then it might be a good idea to see if there is dark matter out there. Whether we say that dark matter is real or relativity is false, there is something that we don't know that we need to find. Which, of course, uh, uh, Tesla tore to shreds uh, right from the outset. I mean, Tesla also thought that you can't split the atom, and seeing as there are nuclear bombs and nuclear power generation, I mean, he was wrong on that. It's not as though just because Tesla disagreed with Einstein, that means that Einstein is wrong. Einstein's theories have held up. So it's very, very important to study the history of the science. It's not just about science, it's about the history of the science. Well, yes, it can give you a better idea of how things used to work and maybe how that wasn't the best way of doing things. But it's not important to know every single detail. There's a lot of details in history. <laughs> and we have more history every day. But when they were doing the, uh, the new curriculum for, uh, for both public education and for college curriculum, I don't remember the name of the organization, but the organization in charge of putting out the textbooks, they actually, con Einstein was the consultant as to whether or not they should displace Maxwell and some of these other physicists that came before in favor of relativity. Now, I don't know how much of a gullible goof, how much of a coincidence theorist one has to be completely bereft of logic and reason in order to not understand what a conflict of interest is. So this is where I'd like a source because I did try to find what he's talking about here and I just couldn't find it at all. All I could find was one correspondence related to textbooks, which Einstein wasn't even saying this is what should be in the textbooks. It was just, hey, this guy seems like a good guy to write textbooks. But here's the thing, even if events did happen exactly as Mindshock described, I don't see the problem with getting Einstein to help with that, as long as his theory has been accepted. Like, what's Einstein going to do? Is he going to trick everyone into believing his theory when it's already been accepted? Tell Einstein to come in and, you, you know what, Einstein, should we put you as true in the books? Or these other guys that are your competition? I mean, if his theory is widely accepted at the time, you're obviously going to put Einstein's theory as being true whether or not you consult Einstein on this. At least with consulting Einstein, you can portray it accurately, which, you know, is kind of the job of textbooks, isn't it? So that was kind of my starting point uh, when dissecting relativity years after first learning it and then just realizing it doesn't hold up. 
a lot of different uh, scientists and mathematicians and physicists of all kind have spoken out against it. Yet, despite a lot of people speaking out against it, it's still a pretty good scientific theory. I mean, you would have to come up with your own theory. That's the thing. That's what these other scientists don't have. The theory that has come closest is Mond, and that theory has its own problems. Well, the internet itself wasn't popular, but of the people that were on the internet, many f were familiar with the BBS systems in the late 80s, early 90s, and then they kind of got a little bit more uh, in the realm of what are forums, which have since mostly... They don't really seem to be that popular anymore. Everybody's kind of on Reddit or other social media, not actually forum-based websites. But there were a bunch of different science forums, and I was actually studying the ancients and, again, why they believed in a geocentric system. Okay, it took half of the video part of the video to actually get to geocentrism. That is 10 minutes, 15 if you include the 5-minute timer countdown. And if you want to say, oh, but your video didn't mention geocentrism until like two thirds of the way into the video. It's not my fault, it's my shock's fault. <laughs> Blame him. Anyway, why did the ancients believe in geocentrism? Probably because they had no way to know that the earth was moving. It'd probably take a lot of creative thinking to come up with something like that. And boy howdy, let me tell you about the schools back then and all the chemicals they were putting in the water. There were some pretty serious uh, physicists discussing geocentrism, not necessarily in that it was true, but if it were true, how would it work and how do we know the difference between geocentrism and heliocentrism? Because, of course, it is very difficult based on frame of reference without actually not just being in space outside of the Earth, but you would have to be so far in space as to observe both the Earth and the Sun from an outside viewpoint. Well, the thing about frames of reference is there's no objective one. You can say that the Earth is moving from one frame of reference, but then have it stationary in another. Though with some frames of reference, weird mysterious forces suddenly appear for some reason. Especially if you're using a rotating reference frame, then you get all sorts of interesting things with rolling a ball on a roundabout. There were over 200 professors that were actually geocentrists, so they believed that the sun rotated around the earth. Now, they obviously, they didn't go into flat earth or anything, so I guess everybody was still go going by the globe theory. I mean, 200 professors is a tiny amount, and, you know, on the internet, people have anonymity. So people can say whatever they want about themselves, and many people won't check it. Like, I could say that I'm a pro jet skier. I don't even know if that's a thing. But I can say that I'm one. I could also say that I'm a professional voice actor, and that might seem a little bit more credible. But that doesn't mean that it's true. Though, if someone hires me, that would change that. There were over 200 of them, and of course they didn't go public. I think one or two of them was public. Maybe that's a sign that they're not who they say they are, or maybe they're just joking around. Who knows? This is the internet, after all. And then, of course, years later, there was the, uh, the documentary The Principle which is about the Copernican principle and just assuming the Earth goes around the sun without actually having evidence for it. I mean, there's the fact that it makes fewer assumptions than geocentrism, and it's able to predict the orbits of planets a lot better than geocentrism can. When you consider the hard time that they had trying to make geocentrism work, something came along that was a lot better at predicting where planets would be, Obviously, people are going to go, hey, I think this one is more correct than what we currently have. The observations simply fit one model better than the other. I'm pretty sure that counts as evidence. Yeah, it was just curious to see all of these uh, older, in their 40s, 50s, 60s professors who were actually geocentrists. Or at least claiming to be. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> you could say they were all lying, but they, they were giving arguments and, you know, in early 2000s web-based formats. I mean, flash diagrams, etc. And and some of them were, were into the equations as well. I mean, it's not exactly hard to lie on the internet. That's not been something that's ever been particularly difficult to do. And if it were, then you wouldn't have flat earthers because, as the saying goes you got to lie to flirt. But I don't really like to get into the equations. I mean, counting unicorns, even if you count perfectly, that doesn't mean the unicorns are real. So I prefer to stick to actual concepts. And then you can build the math on them. You can build the math on the arguments to see if the math could support the argument. But if the argument is invalid, why are you going to waste your time with math for? I mean, the whole point of maths is to check, does this thing make accurate predictions? It's easy enough to say, oh, this is what we should see. And then we see it 
to an extent, but maybe we don't see it as much as we expect to. I mean, the whole flat earth argument of we see further than we should on a globe falls flat if you can't use maths. And let's say that you've got an observation of something disappearing bottom first and you want to know whether it fits a globe or a flat earth. Now you can do maths to work out, okay, which is this actually closer to? Because flat earthers do actually try to claim that yes, things actually do disappear bottom first, at least a little bit. I mean, if they didn't admit that, then they'd have literally no argument whatsoever. But my point is maths does need to be used in determining whether something is correct or incorrect. You can't just base it solely on logical arguments. Yeah, that was kind of my base. So then when I first heard of the flat earth theory, I still laughed at it, obviously. <laughs> the YouTube videos. I thought it, I genuinely thought it was a joke. Well, same, but I mean, I still laugh at them because, you know, they're a bunch of goobers. You know, they're, they're funny little guys. But I was already also familiar with the NASA fakery and the moon landing debate, so to speak. I mean, so was I, so I thought. As time went on, I started to realize, oh, the evidence actually does actually point towards this happening. I actually found that flat earthers do often try to use moon landing denial to get people into flat earth because moon landing denial seems more plausible to a lot of people than flat earth. And if you find that someone agrees with you on something like that, then it's a lot easier to pull them in. But eventually I re-evaluated the evidence on the moon landing and realized, oh, actually it did happen. If it didn't happen, then it should be super easy to fake, but even Hollywood struggles to fake it. That's the simple, this video has gone on for a long time and I want to keep things brief answer. I'll probably only go over a few more clips because, you know, this video is starting to get pretty lengthy. And then my dog ain't my homework excuse when somebody asked for the telemetry data, they lost, what was it, almost 20,000 reels? Well, mistakes do happen. As much as flat earthers might like to pretend that they're all a bunch of robots, it turns out that they're not. They're humans. At least I'm pretty sure they are. I, I'm already deeply familiar with the geocentrism versus heliocentrism arguments going back uh, several decades already. So I'm in a pretty unique position and I'm familiar with the fraud of relativity. Despite that, I don't think I've heard a good argument so far. What, there's a bunch of people on a web forum that said that geocentrism was right? This actually somewhat verges into the territory of not even being wrong because they're not saying anything to be wrong about. It'd be like if I said, I think the earth is a donut. Everybody likes donuts and the torus shape, great shape, especially for a planet. Even though you'd be able to tell that I've got something wrong there, I'm not really saying enough to be able to point out exactly where I'm getting things wrong. That's what it kind of feels like with this guy. He is wrong, but he's not really saying anything substantive enough to be able to argue against. And the reason why it makes it hard is because they can always say, oh, I didn't actually argue for that, don't misinterpret me. And it's like, okay, well, what did you actually try to argue there? So really, I should probably change tactics. Here's my argument against Mindshock. Geocentrism is false. The reason why, satellites. But if Mindshock somehow finds this video and says, oh, but don't you know, NASA fakes their satellites with balloons. I have enough plausible deniability to say natural satellites, dumbass.